All right. No resemblance. <laughs> he has longer hair. Maybe me if I live that long. <laughs> Pastor Mike is out of town this week, so he asked me to get up and continue in a series he started, a series known as Food for Thought. Uh, what we're looking at here over the weeks here preceding Easter is we're looking at Christ and his disciples celebrating the Passover feast. And this was a last opportunity for Christ to instruct his disciples and to try and feed them not only physically, but primarily to feed them spiritually. So we took this opportunity to summarize a lot of the main points of Christianity and about his ministry. These words that he had to say to his disciples are equally applicable to every one of us today. So to me, it's an excellent series and an excellent way to ramp up to Easter. Today, we're going to be looking specifically at some passages in John 14, uh, verses 5 through 11. They're published in your worship bulletin. In the Bible, it says in the book of John, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. I don't believe that it's oversimplifying things when I say that as human beings, deception is the number one problem every single one of us has. Every sin ever committed, every crime ever committed, every failure of mankind ultimately, I believe, can be traced back to one simple thing, lies. Because we are deceived, it, these deceptions poison our belief system, and based on these wrong beliefs, we make bad decisions. And these bad decisions lead to bad results and bad consequences that we really would not have chosen had we had the blinders off. From the original sin on down, you will find a common thread of deception, a common thread of lies. And one of the main problems of deception is not only that these lies cause problems out here in our world and in our lives and in our families. But these lies also cause a double whammy because these deceptions block us off from our only hope, our only solution. These lies block us off from God. So, because our conception of God is very often skewed, it's poisoned by wrong beliefs, then it really doesn't matter if these wrong beliefs cause us to go so far into the darkness or so far out here that we end up working against God overtly. It doesn't really require us to go so far out into the left field that we strap on the goat leggings and prance around the campfire during the summer solstice doing the goat dance. That's not the point. You see, if all it does is paralyze us so we cannot believe the truth, we cannot go to God. We're not going 
so far into the other side that we're going to become overt Satanists because that would take a measure of faith too. Through this deception, the real problem for most of us is just that we throw our hands up and say, I don't know. We look at God sideways. We have this, these certain conceptions. And unfortunately, most of us never think about how we think. Most of us never even stop long enough to ask ourselves, what do I really believe and what is the source of my information? Is it true? Are my beliefs grounded in fact or fiction? And that's why the people that came along beside me and helped me to get my, my life turned around, what I'm so grateful about is they did not approach me about my behaviors. They approached me about my beliefs. Because they were wise enough to understand that it was my beliefs that were causing my bad behaviors. And to whack away at the roots of my real problem, they didn't start with my behaviors, they started with my belief system. And thank God they challenged me on every point. What do you believe and why did you believe that? And where did that come from? If you believe certain things to be true about God, did you read that in a book? If so, what book? Did somebody tell you that? If so, who told you that? Uh, did, did you hear that on television? What channel were you watching at the time? Did it come to you in an opium dream? What is the source of your information? And a lot of times I had to honestly say, beats me, I don't really know. And that's where it started for me. So, if lies are the germs that cause bad behaviors, if lies are the germs that cause the ills of mankind, if lies are the germs that cause us to create pain and problems, not only in our lives, but in the lives of people we love, then if lies are the germs that cause that, then the truth must be the antidote. And that's where Jesus Christ was all about truth. In the old King James, he almost always prefaced his statements with the line, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Which translates into, I tell you the truth. And later he went on to say, I am the truth, the way, and the life. So he was truth incarnate. And God, being the Father of Jesus, is the Father of truth. In the Bible, it also talks about the devil being a father. And what it says about his parentage, it says that the devil is the father of all lies. Interesting. So where you have on the one side the power of deception, you have an even greater power on the other side, the power of truth. You cannot lie to a man who knows the truth. You cannot do it. Because that truth will set you free both from the power of the lie and the power of the liar. Once you know the truth, you cannot be lied to. But how do we know the truth? How can we tell? Especially because we live in a world of deception. We're not only bombarded with deceptions from without, but according to Paul in the book of Romans, we're bombarded with deceptions from within. We all have this lying lower nature through Adam. Sin within. This, this thing in our head that skews information and feeds us half-truths. Obsessions, illusions, delusions, self-deceptions, distortions, fantasies, fallacies. A bunch of words we use for our thinking problem. A twisting of the truth. And it's easy to talk about a lot of ways that these deceptions manifest themselves in our lives. But I think to, to really get a lot of bang for our buck, we really need to whack away at this thing at its very roots. And that is, how are we deceived about God? And this 
leads to the question, what do we believe to be true about God and why do we believe it? When the Bible says God is a father, that's not really comforting for some of us, is it? (laughs) Our father. Oh, here we go again. (laughs) Another father. Because not all of us, but some of us have had less than stellar parenting. (laughs) Some of us have had earthly parents, earthly fathers that perhaps were less than godly or less than ideal. And unfortunately, the nature of our experiences as children is we start to weave our understanding of our earthly parents into our heavenly one. So we start to project onto God defects that our own parents had. And then again, we get deceived into thinking God, our Heavenly Father, is just like our earthly ones. And so what I'd like to look at today are a couple of very common and very commonly wrong conceptions of God that I know I struggled with. And perhaps some of you have struggled with at different times. And then in laying out a couple of wrong conceptions, hopefully we can back into a better or correct one. And the first one that I could not escape most of my life is this picture of God not as a loving Father, but as a judge. When I thought of the throne room, What that set off in my head wasn't pictures of a throne room, but a courtroom. I don't know about you all, but I will confess I have been to court. (laughs) When I was 16 years old, for instance, I was uh, declared a juvenile delinquent by a judge in Turner County, South Dakota. A, A highway patrolman rolled up while I was sitting on the hood of my car in a side street in Viberg, uh, drinking a beer, (laughs) an adult beverage, and uh, which apparently I was to find out later is illegal in the state of South Dakota. (laughs) So I was ended up uh, meeting a judge who, to me at that time, seemed a lot like God. (laughs) I still to this day remember exactly what he told me. He said that I was not going to make it snow in his courtroom, (laughs) whatever that means, (laughs) but it was the way he said it. (laughs) Uh, But all my life, I've feared death. I've feared judgment. I feared punishment because it's not just going to court and being found guilty that scares most of us. We know we're guilty, right? (laughs) So the technicality of the trial isn't the threatening thing. It's when you have to go back for the sentencing. That's the part that you really would like to avoid. What's the punishment? And in this courtroom drama, in my head, without ever really thinking about it, one of the fatal flaws of that understanding was I had the players wrong. Now, I pictured God Almighty as the judge sitting up there on the bench with the black flowing robes. God is my judge. And I had myself rightly pictured as the defendant. Durr. (laughs) And I am going into court knowing I'm guilty. Double (laughs) durr. So I am going into court not only guilty but defenseless. And I can try to plead my case, maybe hoping for a reduction in sentence once I explain the extenuating circumstances, but it really doesn't matter because I'm guilty. The prosecuting attorney in that courtroom drama was also God. Because we all know what God does during the daytime, right? And I mean, his main thing is to sit down and keep a dirty laundry list of everything that we think, say, and do that's wrong. I mean, isn't that true about God? Isn't that what God's job is? He sits up there with this long, flowing piece of paper, and he looks down on it. Oh, there he goes again. (laughs) Oh, not that one. Oh, there's number 5,012. Oh, yeah, another one of those. And... That's God's job. 
And one day we're reading in 1 Corinthians 13. And it starts to dawn on me where I had the players wrong because what I love about 1 Corinthians 13 or have come to love about it, a lot of us are familiar with this. If you've ever been to a wedding, they read this poetic thing. You know, uh, it says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But we're studying in another part of the Bible where we find this line, and you can find it throughout the New Testament, that says God is love. Aw? Well, you see, if that is true, if God is love, then what it says about love in 1 Corinthians 13 must also be equally true about God. Which means that it would not be a theological stretch to go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and say, according to the Bible, God is patient. That's new information. I thought God was, you know, come on, hurry up, get it on, get it on now. Kind of like my earthly dad. God is kind. Oh, God is kind. I thought his permanent feature was a big frown. I thought he was mean, unapproachable. No, God is kind. God does not envy. See, envy, one definition of envy is sadness at another's good fortune. God doesn't get bummed out when we get something good or have something nice. God does not boast. God is not proud. You see, God is not some celestial egomaniac. I thought he was some guy with megalomania that thought, oh, the world must revolve around me. But he's not that way. God is not rude. He is not self-seeking. The Bible says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He's not after your stuff. God is not easily angered. Again, what? I thought you had to tiptoe around him because just to try and become invisible so he didn't fly off the handle. I thought he was really touchy. But no, it says here that God is not easily angered. And then it goes on to say, and here it is, God keeps no record of wrongs. Huh? Well, if love keeps no record of wrongs and God is love, then God cannot keep a record of wrongs, can He? So if God's not keeping the dirty laundry list, who is? See, you know who I left out of that courtroom drama was the player that counted the most, the devil. He, and not God, is the keeper of the list. Why? Because He is the prosecuting attorney. It was Jesus that offered His blood, but the devil that demanded it. And it is the devil and not God who is legalistic, as it turns out. And He was the one using us to get to God. That's the game. It goes on to say that God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. God always protects, always trusts. God always hopes and always perseveres. God never fails. So you see, that changes everything because if the devil is the prosecuting attorney keeping the list of my wrongs, trying to convince the judge to convict me, I am not defenseless. That's the point of Christianity. I have a prosecuting attorney who happens to be the judge's son. <laughs> oh, I'm starting to like how this is playing out all of a sudden. You mean my lawyer and the judge are in cahoots? <laughs> Cool. And this is where Jesus, in his brilliance, came up with the perfect defense. 
He didn't plead my case and say it wasn't my fault or I wasn't even there or I didn't do those things. Instead, he made an even bolder play in court. He stood up and announced to the judge, Your Honor, my client could not have done those things because I did them. Every single one of the things on that list, I, myself, am pleading guilty to. Now you have to set my client free. Wow. I, they let me go. They take my lawyer through town and they punish him. They convict him of my crimes and he pays for my crimes. Which I still, it doesn't sit right with me, but because he is a brilliant defense attorney, he knew that according to the law that he was convicted under, the law and the grave and death cannot hold an innocent man. And even though he pled guilty to capital offenses requiring death, three days later, he was back again. Why? Because the devil, as a prosecuting attorney, thought, this is falling right into my hands. I love how this is working. I didn't want him anyway. It was God's son that I was really after, and now I've got him. Oops. And as Jesus slipped through his fingers... It all started to make perfect sense. So you see, the Bible clearly tells us, and it's in our worship bulletin, it tells us, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you look up the term no condemnation in the Greek, do you know what it says? No condemnation. (laughs) It couldn't be any plainer. No means none. Zero. Nada. None. But how many of us really believe that? But if we believed it, we could agree with Hebrews. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive punishment? No. Receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The second false conception of God that I know that I fell into and a lot of others fell into was seeing God not just as a judge but as a less than benevolent father figure. Because again, going back to our earthly parents, I think sometimes we tend to see our fathers as less than relationally. We don't really connect with them on a human or an emotional level so much as we just see them for the role they play and what they do. And I believe two of the primary roles assigned to a traditional father is that of protector and provider. God is, my dad is doing his job as long as there's a roof over our head and food on our table and clothes on our back, then, and as long as nobody's breaking in and threatening us or kidnapping us or then he's done his job. He kept us alive another day, and his work is done. But unfortunately, when I looked at God, I started to look at God sideways because I thought if God is my protector, and if God is my provider, he's not doing a very good job. (laughs) Why? Well, he's not a very good protector because I have pain. I have problems. He didn't insulate me from things the way I thought he should. Unfortunately, as it turns out, one of the main things I needed to be protected from was from myself, (laughs) from my own bad decisions. Now, for those that have children, you know that you can do everything try to do everything right as a parent, but your kids still have self-will. And because they have self-will, ultimately, they're going to do what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, the way they're going to do it, aren't they? And you see, when God gave us self-will, what He did, He respected that enough to say, you know what, I am going to be there for you every step of the way and watch over you. And I will protect you to a degree, but primarily what I'm offering you is not problem-solving, but rather problem-preventing. 
if you would follow my rules, if you would come under the blanket of my protection and do things my way, I can keep you pretty safe under here. But if you choose to wander out, to exercise your self-will and make decisions, some of those decisions that you make that violate my will can put us in positions to be hurt. And even God Himself cannot prevent that in the short term. So we live in a fallen world. There is pain. There are problems. And especially, we get hurt not only because of the bad decisions we make, but we get injured by the bad decisions that other people make. And ultimately, that turns out to be the horrible nature of sin. Is that invariably, it's the innocent ones that pay for the sins of the guilty. That's why God hates sin, not just because it hurts us. As my first spiritual advisor accurately pointed out, he said if our sins only hurt us, they really wouldn't even be sins now, would they? That would just be instant justice. But it's when we make decisions and we do things that hurt people that don't have it coming. My favorite example is when was the last time you saw a headline that said drunk driver killed by drunk driver? (laughs) It just doesn't seem to work that way, does it? See, it's always somebody that doesn't have it coming. Somebody that, that is just sitting out there and just a sitting duck and becomes a victim. So the piece that I love about Hope Community Church is The message that we carry is so good about differentiating between now and then. That's why I love this particular passage I put in our worship bulletin where it said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. I thought God was not a good protector and He's not a good provider because not only do I have things I don't want, I don't have things I do want. So what's up with that? I don't have enough money. I don't have enough fame and popularity. I don't have enough good looks, obviously. I don't have enough of any of this stuff. So if God's such a great provider, where's all my stuff? And you see, to differentiate between now and then, to understand that God's primary solution for our pain and our problems and our suffering, even the to protect us and save us from the consequences of our own bad decisions is not to make this a perfect world, but to take us out of the world. That's the blessing of death. You see, true hell would be to live here forever. That's why one of the most fascinating bits of of understanding I ever got was in the book of Genesis. Remember that part where... Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. And then what did God do? Put these flaming swords at the entrance so they couldn't come back in. And stationed uh, angels there, you know, spiritual beings to guard that. And I thought, wow, he must have really been mad. (laughs) Whoa, flaming swords now. Wow. But you see, that was not an act of anger. That was not an act of vengeance. That was not an act of revenge. That, my friends, was an act of love. Why did God take such great pains to keep them out of the garden? Because the tree of life was still there. Had they partaken of the fruit of the tree of life in their fallen state, they would have been doomed. Doomed to walk this earth forever in a fallen state. No hope. No escape, ever. So you see, God's extreme measures, because He loved them so much, to keep them from doing an even worse thing than they had already done. 
it enabled him to fulfill our greatest hope, which is not for him to come down here and make this perfect, but for him to come take us to where it is truly perfect. That is the hope that we all live for. So you see, with that understanding, if you're confined to a wheelchair, you're not going to be in there forever. If you're in prison, life without parole is not forever. If you are trapped in a sickly body, you are not trapped in that body forever. If you have financial problems you will never solve, you are not going to be in debt forever. If you are trapped in a bad relationship, you are not stuck in that dead-end relationship forever. If you have a job you can't stand and you feel for whatever reason you can't get out, which maybe you should, (laughs) but you can't be trapped in that forever. Our hope is to get out of all of this. Because... God's solution for it all is to take us to heaven where He promises us a new body, one that never gets sick, never dies, never gets old, to promise us riches beyond imagine, solving all of these problems, to put us in a position where we never suffer pain again, where He says every tear will be wiped from their eyes, to put us in a position where we no longer struggle relationally, We have no more enemies where we don't get hungry or thirsty or tired or cold. A perfect place forever. And you see, with that thought in mind, that brings us to the last thought that I'd like to make. And that is, as Mike has done some outstanding series on trying to rectify the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New. He did that one thing, will the real God please stand up? (laughs) Because if you study the God of the Old Testament, you cannot conclude that this is a nice guy. (laughs) And then you come to the New Testament and you read passages like today's that we're working through and you think, well, I can get my hands around Jesus. Jesus I like. Jesus I'm okay with. Because... Jesus was a rebel. I'm a rebel. I like rebels. (laughs) Jesus was very countercultural. He didn't, he wasn't always politically correct. He didn't toe the party line. This guy was a revolutionary. And he was tough. And he went toe to toe with people that could have killed him and eventually did. He wasn't afraid. He was fearless. He did some bold things. That thing with the money changers in the temple. Man, how many of us would have liked to have done that the way they were ripping us off? He did it. (laughs) And this guy went toe-to-toe with religious leaders. You know, I never was a big fan of some TV evangelists. And I saw some hypocrisy out there. And I've been treated mean by people in the church. Not members, but people in authority. And then Jesus comes along and says, they do not speak for me, and they do not speak for my Father. They are not of me, and these people are not right in what they're saying to be true about God. And you do not have to give them money, and you do not have to submit to their false spiritual authority. Because these people do not represent the real God, and they certainly do not speak for me. Whoa. And instead of hanging out with religious people, he hung out with who? People like me. (laughs) Thieves and robbers and, and tax collectors, mafioso types. People that wanted to change but didn't know how. And those were the people he loved and embraced. And he never once said harsh words to them. He referred to them as his precious lost sheep. But on the other hand, the religious people, he called them snakes and broods of vipers and wolves in sheep's clothing and sons of hell. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Because the God I knew was saying all that bad stuff to me and he was embracing those hypocrites. This is really weird. But then I still had to rectify this to bring it all together between this Jesus character and the God of the Old Testament. 
How do you do that? So one of the ways, and I will be the first to admit that what I'm about to present might not be theologically 100% accurate. (laughs) We can nitpick this later. But the concept of it, to try and present something that at least begins a different thought process or a different way of seeing things and a different way of filing them in our heads, just for fun. Let's say that this is the situation with the Old Testament. And the question we're going to ask is, if God is so loving, then is the Old Testament incorrect? What if I maintained that the Old Testament was not incorrect, but rather incomplete? Imagine a situation where you have never met your father, never met the man, but you had older brothers and sisters who knew him. They left you an old book, a diary of their experiences and their perceptions of your father. Now, unfortunately, their account of your father was incomplete because this diary only chronicled their experiences that they had when they were very, very young. And I might add, very, very immature. Infants. Terrible twos. Three years old, maybe four. Then the book stopped. Technically, there was nothing inaccurate in the book. It was a true story. It just wasn't the whole story. But it was all you've got to go on. Better than nothing. Right? So here's what your siblings had to say about dear old dad. Dad yelled a lot. Sometimes he even spanked us when we got too far out of line. He was really into discipline. Dad was no fun. He wouldn't let us play in the street or play with matches or play with Ginsu knives. Uh, Dad even had a thing about building golden calves. (laughs) He didn't seem to like it so much when we did things that could get the neighbor kid killed. (laughs) He didn't like it when we lied, especially when we blamed one of our siblings for something that was really our fault. He wasn't happy when we stole things. He hated it when we demanded things just because other kids had them. Dad was serious. He was always making rules and laying down the law. He even went so far as to write his rules down on big tablets. I guess it wasn't good enough to just tell us what to do, like we didn't get it the first hundred times. (laughs) Dad was big and strong, or at least he seemed that way, maybe because we were so small and weak. His strength wasn't comforting. We were afraid that he was going to use his strength against us. Thus, Dad was really intimidating and scary. And Dad was old, really old. What could he possibly have in common with us? We didn't talk to him a lot because we just assumed that he couldn't relate to us or understand our problems. Dad promised to reward us if we did the right things, but we don't know a lot about that because we rarely did the right things. Dad could even be violent. He never, ever hurt us, but we did see him go medieval on some bad men who tried to hurt our family. Wow. We worried that maybe we would be next. (laughs) Dad always said that he loved us, but he didn't seem very loving. So we loved ourselves and the things in this world, and we loved having fun. We were happiest when Dad wasn't around. Now here's what was left out of the book. Dad was always around, especially when we weren't aware of his presence. He was always working for our betterment. He stayed awake at night and watched over us when we were sick or injured or threatened, or worried, or alone. He protected us, 
provided for us, produced an inheritance for us, prepared a life for us, and prepared us for life. He didn't just tell us that He loved us. He showed us His love through His actions. Too bad that page was never written. So the day finally comes. You can't postpone it any longer. It's time to finally go and meet Dad. Following the directions in the book, you go to see him, expecting the worst. But you don't even get close to where he lives. He comes running out to meet you. Running. Now this is an old man. You've never seen an old guy run before. He's pretty spry. (laughs) He's obviously been watching for you. Waiting for you. He meets you while you are yet a long ways off. He takes his coat off and puts it on you because you look cold. Then he takes his big expensive ring off of his hand and he puts it on your finger. Weird. You try to start a conversation with him by blurting out a list of things you've done wrong because you assume this will make him happy. But he's not interested. He doesn't want to hear it. Instead, he starts yelling to anyone who will hear it, Hey, everybody, I want you to meet my kid. This is my son, or this is my daughter. He acts like he's actually proud of you. He starts telling people about your accomplishments. He's obviously been keeping up on you. He makes a big deal about things you kind of took for granted. And he doesn't mention your failures at all. He takes you into his home and instantly makes you his guest of honor. He kills his fatted calf and throws you a huge party. A welcome home party. A welcome home party. It's not at all what you expected. He is not at all who you expected. Was the book wrong? No. It was just incomplete. The story that was missing was yours. As we call the worship team up and close with a final song, the confusion of the passages that we started with today is that when Jesus showed up, Everyone was looking at Jesus and they all said pretty much the same thing. You're nothing like your dad. (laughs) You're nothing like your dad. And conversely, what Jesus said in response is, my father is exactly like me. And that forces us to recalibrate our thinking, doesn't it? And it forces us to re-examine our beliefs and our perceptions about God. And hopefully, what we, the conclusion we come to is that Jesus really was telling the truth when he said, my father is exactly like me. And Lord, our prayer as we go out from here today is a very simple one. Help us not only to know about you, but help us to know you. Help us to know You personally and help us to know You accurately and perhaps re-examine some of our deceptive beliefs about Your true nature and character. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.